Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Welcome to the big show. I've already had people reach out and tell me games we missed or haven't played yet from 1981 that I didn't have lined up. So it looks like we'll be in 1981 a little longer than expected. We last left off with Thief for the Apple II. And let's continue on our journey playing every game from 1981. Our next game is Threshold for the Commodore VIC-20. We've already seen this one for the Apple II when I could pin the release date down, and we have two versions. First, we'll start with the VIC-20 version of Threshold. Let's take a look at the box first. We got the, yes, rough-edged box, not reconstructed, uh, an actual scan. You can see even see a discount price at the top. Looks like uh, buck ninety nine or ninety nine cents, and this one is released by Sierra Vision. We're right in between when online systems and Sierra made the name Sierra, or because before it was online systems. So we're right there in between, and so this is one of the first releases with Sierra Online. It's a dark age for the Earth Federation. Our home planet's under attack, and our colonies are raided unmercifully. Space travel has become a death wish as more and more enemy ships find their way past the outer defenses and into the paths of friendly trade. Supplies must go through. However, as the pilot of the Federation fighter Threshold, it's your mission to clear the, the tradeways of the pirating fleets so that supplies can get to the defense bases and protect our world and its colonies from the lawless invaders that roam the galaxy. I don't remember that story on the Apple II. And it sounds like a story that you'd see for a, a massive merchant tr space trading game. But no, it's it's just a fixed shooter. <laughs> so uh, don't get your hopes up too much. Hey, welcome, welcome. Yes, we are streaming live the latest episode of Chronologically Gaming. We have an ad for Threshold. You can see it right in the center there with Lunar Leaper, which is so good on the, the VIC-20. Also Marauder, Crossfire, and Aquatron. Haven't seen Aquatron or Marauder just yet, but we will. And uh, that's it for the artwork we have for Threshold. The other versions are alternate versions of the cartridge. Let's pop it and play with a cartridge. Threshold for the Commodore VIC-20 released at some point in 1981 by Sierra Online. Now, the Apple II is pretty impressive. Now, I admit I kind of rated it high. I gave it four stars for the time. And it's because we didn't see too many that were incorporating elements for a fixed shooter. But let's see what the VIC-20 looks like. How's it play? How's it play? So it works with the VIC-20 joystick. Feels good. Well, hit detection seems a little off. It seemed like the bullet went right through that guy. Oh, man. And they just give you a hail of bullets that you're supposed to dodge. The big things that Threshold... See, it looked like my bullet went right through that guy. <laughs> the big things that Threshold does is not just the fuel, but your uh, your gun can overheat while you play the game. And you do go level by level, changing what you see with different enemies. Yeah, it does seem like my bullet's going through the guy, or through the enemies, when it should be making contact. I know I'm not the best shooter player, but um, I can tell whenever I'm making a shot or not. If you look on the right side, I have a meter showing my overpowered gun. And then the fuel meter, I think, is still the same as we've seen before. It's like a timer. All right, well, all, right. the comparison from Apple II, while we haven't played them back-to-back, -back, the Apple II version using their joystick was much better control. Even though it's a fixed shooter, you're only moving left and right, it feels a little sluggish here on the uh, 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 VIC-20. And my laser already overheated. So what do you do when your laser overheats? You just sit there and wait. We also didn't have the problem with the laser overheating as much before. Like I said, we got firing back. So you got to take your time. It's the strategic fix shooter. They should have just given you a rating system like they did with Galaga in the arcades. So you can shoot as much as you want. And if you mess up, it just tells you later what your accuracy was. Oh. It's also not as impressive with the scrolling in the background. Apple II did a very nice uh, faux 3D effect. Made it feel like you're playing mo just more than a fixed shooter. Oh gosh, now we're fighting clouds. Plus the enemies and animations are really stripped down for the VIC-20. And I actually thought that's because that was the, the requirements of the VIC-20. But then we saw games like Lunar Leaper and... Uh, Dot Gobbler uh, for the VIC-20 and... I'm oh, sorry, not Dot Gobbler. I haven't seen that one yet. But the, the Pac-Man clone. And you realize, oh, well, the VIC-20 can do that and more. If you, in the right hands, it is, it is a really good system. 
four games. And wait till Lines 82, we're going to see some really good ones. Uh, that was my fault. <laughs> Game over. Well, just like we saw before, Threshold just has wave of wave of different enemies with different patterns. But considering the Apple II version, it's not really up to snuff with that one. So I'm going to say it's subpar considering the other games we played. I want to say still three and a half stars. It's uh, a, still a, an above average game you could play for the uh, home computer. But you know what? No, I'm going to say three. We're going average. Threshold is an average game for 1981. Well, let's see the other version. Let's move on to Threshold for the Atari home computer. How does this compare to the Apple II or the VIC-20? Let's start with the box for Threshold. Now, you notice it's a different box, and I did this kind of to see the difference between online systems and Sierra because they did both. This one was uh, just online systems by Warren Schwader and Ken Williams. Way to go, Warren and Ken. Excellent artwork for the front, and then flip it over on the back. It's the same story we read before, so I'll save you the... The, the drama of a space shooter that's that's just move left, right, and fire. But we also have other boxes that were used for this one. So you can see this one looks a lot like we just showed for the VIC-20. It's just the later release with a newer box under Sierra Vision. Sierra, I like the sound of that. Let's use Sierra more often. I think you should, Ken and Roberta. And then flip it over to see the different boxes. There's the ad for Threshold, one of the first ones we saw in Softline Magazine. It's an arcade game with alien attackers galore. Got to get those arcade games for your home computer. And the same ad we saw last time. All right, we have a manual too. So because it's the Atari version, uh, here's a few words about your ship. So it breaks down what the armaments are, your hyper warp driver, slow down and speed for a short period because the energy needed for the weaponry, the driver can only be used once during each flight. Kind of showing you the, the threshold. That's the point of the, the title. It's also equipped with Delta class lasers, extremely heat, heat sensitive. You'll have to be careful to keep them from overheating during the course of battle. If your lasers overheat at any time, you'll experience a temporary malfunction, just like we did back on the VIC-20. And then you can see the controls. There is the, actually, it almost looks like the joystick for the VIC-20 in this manual, but I was told this was the manual for the Atari home computer. Atari home computer, you can just plug in the VCS joystick. So it tells you how to begin play. We got that part down. There's five ships per mission. Your flight is over. And I did like that about the threshold. You get five lives and the usual three we've seen. And then your mission is complete when you identify and destroy the last of the aliens. The last group will be very special and very easy to identify because of their characteristics. And it doesn't tell us. I don't think we saw that even on the Apple II. How do we play again? Suspend the game. Oh, that's right. And this one has the pause. Kind of like a precursor for the Atari 5200, which is eventually, that's what the Atari computer turns into. It's very similar architecture. And they use that as a selling point. If you buy this system, you can finally pause arcade games. Wow, wave of the future. And we're going to be able to do that here on Threshold. All right, there's our five and a quarter floppy disk. Let's pop in and play some Threshold, released at some point in 1981 for the Atari home computer. Is it like the others? Let's find out. All right, so actually I should have read what the manual said to do because this one doesn't just play. I realized I got to see what it says on the left side. We skipped over it. Press the joystick button on the word threshold. Okay, and then you select what speed you want. So we do need to push one, two, three, four. Oh, we can, it's just how fast the background is. Oh, let's crank this up. How fast will it go? Let's see. Four. Let's go as fast as possible. There was a couple games we played that I said, let's start on the slowest setting and then use that as kind of like a rate uh, rating. And, and it said the game ran, ran slow. Well, it's because I selected the slow setting. You get what you paid for. All right, now the colors are totally washed out. The, the gameplay, though, feels much better than the Apple II. As far as um, it doesn't feel sluggish, feels good. The firing works great. And uh, you can barely make out the bullets, though. I did turn the artifacting on because the entire game is black and white. So whenever you play uh, with artifacting on, you get some color, but uh, you can see what it is. It's, it's very uh, washed out drain color. It's like several levels of green that you're playing with. Oh, we're, we're going through life so fast. <laughs> but yeah, it is fast, which is awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Possibly too fast for chronologically gaming. It's great playing a game that's meant to be an, like an arcade game where it gives you enemies with different flight patterns or uh, for, for a space shooter. 
Oh, we're almost out of lives already. Is this our last one? Yeah, there you go. Ship's taking off now. All right, because of how hard it is to see the uh, bullets on the screen, and this is apparently what you would have experienced in 1981, let's turn the artifacting off. So I'm going to give you a little behind-the-scenes peek here. I want to just turn this so we don't have the artifacting, so we can see it in black and white and see if it's a little easier to play. All right, so let's go back into Threshold on the Atari home computer with a slight graphics tweak and see what happens. All right, there we go. So it's really not black and white here, but the same idea. Let's do speed of three this time. Yeah, it seemed it was, but I've been told that the the, the programmers are using the artifacting. Okay, there you go. We're, we're black and white. They used it to display the color. So this is what I was expecting, but we can't make out the bullets a lot easier. It also depends on what monitor you were using. No, oh, not monitor. It, it, we, everyone just used CRTs at the time. So whatever display you had would determine kind of the look and feel of the game. When I went through and collected and found all the games on the Atari 800, which, by the way, the community for this uh, computer is 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 vast. There is so much information because it's a uh, it's a computer that had the name Atari, and there's people that swear by this is one you know the best 8-bit computer that you could ever have, at least you know the 400 and 800. And these games have video clips and examples of them, and they go back and forth with lots of different of the video modes to show how the graphics are displaying. I'd say even more so than the Apple II. There's so many examples where I would check out one game and then see four different looking games. Almost like whenever you play for uh, IBM, DOS, or Tandy systems, that uh, you have the different graphics modes on those computers, so you can see a game in CGA, EGA. It, it kind of feels like that, but with an 8-bit uh, twist to it. Okay, are you going to just... Come here, I can't believe this. There we go. <laughs> oh, now this is nice. Now, I did speed of 3, but this is still really fast. Oh, got me. Big improvement, much more like what we saw on the Apple II. Oh, yeah, there it is. Nice. Well, there you go. Kind of a cool flavor of the different graphics that you see on the uh, Atari home computer. For the time, that's interesting. We played Threshold three different ways. I'm going to give it three different ratings. This one is above average. Three and a half stars for Threshold for the Atari home computer. All right, let's see what video game we are playing next. We're staying on the Atari home computer, and this is Thunder Island. Let's take a look at the artwork for Thunder Island. This one is in a Ziploc baggie, a uh, sleeve, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so we have the uh, operating instructions, and I don't believe we even got the manual. I just have the picture of the, the manual. Uh, there's only one place where I was able to find this on um, uh, Atari Mania. So this is Trapped in a Maze. We're somewhere in the South Pacific, and it looks like it's just a top-down maze game. The classic kind of top-down maze game. 16K is required to play, and one or two joysticks, and it's for one or two players. If only I had a friend here. And here's our advertisement flyer. Thunder Island, and it's the same story we saw in the back of the box. It's about a thousand miles off of the coast of New Zealand. There's an uncharted island. It contains the world's only transparent maze, a maze that can be mechanically set up to endless number of unique variations. Do we really need a star story for a top-down maze game? Well, uh, there it is. So one or two people can play on a cassette only, and there it is, Thunder Island by Craig Patchett. Way to go, Craig. And they give an example of the game screenshot. Well, let's see what it is. We're popping in the cassette and playing some Thunder Island, released at some point in 1981. I don't remember which graphics mode I left this game on, so we'll see when it pops up. It's ready, yes. Nice, we got lightning striking to start us off. So we didn't get the manual, but it looks like I can switch between different games. How many game variations do we have? 10, 11, 12. Okay, 12 different game variations, and then I bet I push option for one or two players. I'm going to play a one-player game. Oh, look at that. Building the maze for us. 
Oh, and now this is an homage to games we played on the Commodore Pet and TRS-80. They took a lot longer to load than this, so you're supposed to memorize... <laughs> I hope you memorize the maze, because here we go. So this is Thunder Island. It is a top-down maze game. We're not talking Pac-Man. We're talking a literal maze game. The very first one we ever saw on the channel. Oh, they give us flashes of light. That's the thunder. That's a cool idea. The very first one we played was Amazing Maze in the arcade. And that was just literally you just move uh, uh, around the maze and find the exit. And nope, didn't memorize the pattern yet. It's going to flash again for us. Let's see if we go up here all the way. Is that it? Yes! Oh, we get a awesome color display for finishing it up. Party in the maze. Is that it? What happens now? Okay, there's a reset. Okay, I'm going to plug another controller and let's see what the two-player mode's like. So we do two players and let's try game mode five. Why not? Here we go. <laughs> That's true. It's like a totally zoomed out adventure game, right? We played a game exactly like this. It built just like this on the Commodore PET. And on the TRS-80, uh, there's another game that's very similar to how it built the maze out. The whole thunder striking thing, that's that's new. That's pretty cool. Okay, so it's a two-player simultaneous maze game. So I have both controllers plugged in, and you can just get, you start on either side of the maze and make your way through to the end. You race to the finish. We've even seen a maze game for the VCS. So the thunder mechanic is cool. It's still just a maze game. How fast can you do it? Gives you a time limit for it. But... It, it's kind of cool because it shows you how far we've come because the, the maze building like that, uh, we had another one for the Acorn Atom that took a long time to build. And seeing it just say, here's the maze and it fill, fills it out for you really fast. It's like we're slowly moving into the future. It's, it's really cool. All right, so for the time, um, I guess it depends on how, what are your miles on how long you would play a maze game with your buddy. But uh, in, anything simultaneously always gets higher marks in my book. Uh, the, the lightning strike is is quaint, cool gameplay mechanic, but I don't know if it's enough to really push into something like above average for the time. Uh, it is by Analog Software, so this was originally for the magazine they they uh, they, they published. So I'm going to say three stars. It's a very average game for what you see for the time. Doesn't do anything super good or super bad. Still a good time in 1981. All right, let's press forward and see our next game. Oh, speaking of TRS-80, here we go with the Time Machine. This is Mysterious Adventures number two by, by Brian Howarth. And we only have, is the images? Yeah, we just have screenshots. Could not find the original box to this one. And it's interesting that nowadays, well, now in the channel, we're in 1981, a lot of the games that are coming out, text adventure games and computer games, have the first rendition of it, and it's so hard to find the manuals and the boxes for the very first version of it. But then it gets re-released over and over again. Commodore 64 and Amstrad CPC, and I can find all the information on those, but the original is sometimes harder to find. All right, here we go with The Time Machine, released at some point in 1981. Another text adventure game using the same text parser as Scott Adams' two-word text parser. So this is Mysterious Adventure number two. What is your name? Last person in the chat was L. Curtis B. So L. Curtis B. It is. Even though the adventure games have never asked for our name. Do we want to use an old save game? No, we do not. There you go. Welcome to Adventure. So the parser was made by Bruce Hansen. This lets you leave without, <laughs> it doesn't say armchair, but you can see it's very similar to what we saw with the Scott Adams Adventure Games. It's the adventure system is what they use this on. So this is part two. It's not a sequel or anything. It's just the series, kind of like Scott Adams Adventures are a series. Welcome to the time machine for Liz and Michael, my wife and son. So I'm in a dense fog on the moors. Obvious exits are here and it's going to break the screen apart like it does with the Scott Adams Adventure series. Now, this text adventure game is brutally hard. It, it is so hard. This game is so hard that it makes me realize that whenever we play any other text adventure games, I am tired of trying to figure it out myself and type in, I'm going to have walkthroughs for most of the text adventure games because this is one of the games that just boasts. I'm the hardest adventure game. You're never going to figure me out. This game begins with a maze. It begins with you in fog and you're lost. I'm, I'm serious. There, there is, there's a pattern you have to follow. So that's how the game starts. And there's no clues in the manual. It's not like copy protection. It is just ridiculously hard. So thank you, uh, Brian Howarth, because you've made me want to look up all the walkthroughs now for all of their text adventure games. So we're not sp spending 
a longer time trying to figure out where to go. Okay, so where do we go first? Let's go north. Okay, so we're still in the dense fog. You can see it changed obvious exits, but we're still totally lost. You have to know where to do. And then now we go west and still in the dense fog. And now we go south and we see a house to the north. How long did it take you in 1981 to figure out the pattern to finally get to the house in the north? Okay, so we go north. And now we're in the doorway. Visible items are gloves and bell. So let's get those gloves. Got to get those. And then we have the bell. So we probably want to ring the bell. Ding dong, ding dong. And no one answers, right? We can ring it again. Yeah, bell rings, but no one answers the door, sadly. Okay, so let's go west. So we're going to go around the building. And now we're by the window. Now we have to get through this window. And I think this is so cool. First thing we do is wear the gloves. Okay, we got the gloves on. And now we have to know which word to type. Smash window. Boom. And it knows we got gloves on and we smash it with our hand. You don't put the gloves on, then you, know, you, you don't get through. So by window, visible items are broken glass. Obvious exits are east. So I can remove the gloves. Get those off of us. And drop the gloves. There we go. And like we do with most two-word text parser games, we go window. That's the way to do it. Oh, that's true. Can we take the glass? I need to try it. Can we go back east? I don't know if it'll let us. No, no, go back west. Oh, we got to say go window, right? Yeah, so we go outside, get glass. It worked. We got glass. So if I do inventory, yeah, we picked up the broken glass. There we go. Thanks, Chiptune. Thanks for coming. <laughs> hey, no problem, man. All right, so we got to go east now. No, no, no. We got to go west. We want to go in that window. We want to go window. Go window. Oh, so we're in the study now. And we have a drawer and a painting, so we better open that drawer. I have no key. Oh, okay. So if we look, painting... There we go. All right, so there's a key in the painting, get key. If we look, so first of all, just looking at a painting makes the key fall out. Or maybe we were touching the painting. I'm not sure. See, you got to know what, what words to type for these text adventure games. Okay, so we got the key, and now we should be able to do um, unlock drawer. Got it. Open drawer. Oh, it looks like it already is open. Oh, yeah, it's already open. And then look, drawer. No way. They got a pistol and a crowbar. Get that pistol. And get crowbar. Nice. Very good. And then now we go east. We're now in the hallway. And we have a door. Open that door up. All right. We're here. Oh, go door, right? Go door. <laughs> I'm never going to forget that. Go door after trying so many different things. I'm in a cellar. Visible items are flashlight, cassette recorder, and strange machine. Now, working with the two-word text parser in 1981, you, you, I've now started to get in the groove of what to type and how to type things in an adventure game. I'm still going to be using walkthroughs because it's still extremely cryptic to know what to do. Uh, even if you are familiar with the puzzle. like we, I already figured out in several adventure games what puzzle it was, but I just didn't know how to tell the computer what I want to do. And that's the huge, at least for 1981. What's going to be interesting is as we move forward with adventure games and see how they change over time playing every single video game, we're going to get better text parsers. We're going to get better story. And we've already seen a few. Zork is one of them. And the, 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 the adventure games are going to have more and more things that you can play and, 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 uh, and do in the game and make it a little bit more intuitive, especially when they add graphics. Just wait for 1984 when King's Quest arrives. I will probably play that game for the entire episode. Oh, sort of. You didn't see the beginning. If you didn't see the beginning, the game begins with you in a fog and a maze and you're totally lost. And you have to know exactly what pattern to move yourself out of the fog. It's, it's ridiculous. Now it's looking pretty normal. Like, you know, get flashlight. Yep, I'll take that. And then we do door, go in the door. Okay, let's play the tape. It says, find three prisms that control my machine. Rescue me. 
So that's your goal. After this this long in the game, it tells us what the whole uh, point of the game is, what we're supposed to be doing. Gotta find three prisms and rescue whoever it is. And it is the time machine, so you're gonna go to different time periods too. All right, so we played the tape. Now, can we enter machine? Yes, so we're in a strange machine. Visible items are three empty sockets and two buttons. And right here, because I'm such a big fan of mist, this gives me mist vibes of you're in an uh, enclosed area and you gotta figure out the puzzle to push different things and move things inside. We're gonna be really excited for that, but that's the 90s. Uh, we're, we're all the way back in 1981. <laughs> all right, there we go. That was the time machine. Just a little taste of what it's like to play. Of all the games we played up to this point, it's using an adventure engine that we've already seen with all the Scott Adams games. And it's not really doing anything super impressive as far as story goes and how it understands how the game plays. So I'm still going to say about three stars. It's around average for the time. All right, now let's see what our next game is. Where are we going now? It's time to go to Japan in the arcades and play Tournament Pro Golf. If this one looks familiar, it's because we played Pro Golf by Data East, but Pro Golf was the standalone arcade cabinet. This is one that's on the Deco cassette system. It makes little slight nuances and changes to the game, and it even has, I believe, yeah, you can see, I'll, I'll point them out of the differences. As far as images go, it's pretty much the same. It's now been rebranded as a Deco cassette game. It's almost the same uh, advertisement flyer. Realistic, exciting, challenging. And there's the example of the Deco cassette arcade system with the colors around the outside. We got to have that. The control panel is an eight way joystick and then it just molds to whatever the game's being played. So this is tournament pro golf, totally different than pro golf. Uh, we're going to, we're going to go to the arcade in Japan and check out the latest Deco cassette that you could switch out in your arcade system. And since it's Deco, that means we're speeding the sucker up. We're not waiting for the cassette to load. When we last played Pro Golf, it was one of the best iterations of golf we'd ever played on the channel, bar none. It was very simple. They made it uh, kind of arcadey, so you didn't have to ha have as much control over your character, but it was automatically picking clubs for us. It was doing a lot of things that we uh, didn't need to spend a lot of time on. So great for the arcade. All right, we're here. Tournament Pro Golf. Let's put a coin in and see how it fares. Yes. So this one adds uh, a few elements to switch it up. Graphics are slightly different, very slightly. Top of the screen though now has a radar. So the way it works is they make this very simple. There's a power meter on the side and all you gotta do is hit the button at the right time. And it, it's, it's automatically gonna switch our clubs out, I think, right? Okay, so every time you go, it gives you a club in the top right corner automatically for the best uh, the, the best example of what you would need at the time. So watch when I, I'm, a, I'm a three iron now, and it's gonna switch us to a seven iron because it knows we're already close to the pin. And do we go over? Oh, oh, we did bounce over, darn. We could try a chip in. Notice how it automatically moves me around. I didn't have to do that. It, it does a lot of things automatically, so it's a really fast paced game of golf and really fun. And then now we go for the putt. <laughs> and overdid it. Now I do have some measure of movement. I can turn the joystick left and right. You can see my shot change left and right. I'll just let it time out this time. And then whenever you want to switch clubs, you move the joystick up and down. Really simple controls. Anybody can do it. As I'm doing, <laughs> as I'm giving up because I'm way, too, way over par. Yeah, the swing animation is way up there. Oh, let's keep playing. Let's put another coin in. So the first time we played Pro Golf, it was it was really good for the time. This one would be a slight notch above that, but I'm still going to rate it the same. Here we go. All the way. Get it. Oh, it hits the tree. Notice the physics on the ball. So, so nice. Okay, so now we're kind of in a spot. I'm going to turn my uh, shot to the left and see what happens. No, I hit the tree again. Oh, oh, and got in the sand. We're in the bunker. Let's get out and see it automatically pick the sand wedge for me. If you don't like the automatic club it picks for you, like right now it just picked five iron, I can move up and down and say, no, I want I want a three iron. Go, hit me hard. 
And at the top of the screen, the radar is showing us where we are. Oh, yeah, look at that. Right on the green. And I think we're straight on. There is no uh, way to determine, like, hills and valleys on the green. Yes, double bogey. I was hoping for an eagle, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. Even So we did a double bogey. It means you can't play. got to put more money in. All right, let's, let's put some more yen in and play some tournament pro golf. We've played golf from different perspectives, different angles, consoles, computers, um, several systems. This is one of the best ways you could play golf at the time. Data East has got a formula here that's, that should hopefully be copied by a lot of people. Yes, par. I think that means we can keep going on the same coin. Okay, good. And they switch up the course every time. I believe it's nine holes that they have for this one. Let's go full out. One wood. Oh, out of bounds. Not good. After playing this, it seems the first pro golf is like a prototype. It's not even in the same field as this. Oh, all the way. Oh, that's weird. The main screen doesn't show the green. You have to follow the radar to know you're close to the green. Okay, let's see if we can turn this a little bit. Yes! Got the par. All right. And we're still going because we got par, right? Yes, there we go. So much fun. Let's turn to the left, get that one wood, and whack it. Uh-oh, not good. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you do have to look ahead at the radar. What's a little off, though, is the radar's going horizontally, like we're playing Defender, but the game's played vertical. I don't know if you consider this Tate mode or not. If it's not a shooter, is it still Tate? Or is it just vertical orientation? A wise choice. Nope, too much. Too much. See, it rotates us around. It's almost too good. It's like playing lazy golf where you don't you don't have to do as much. It does it for you. Yikes, triple bogey, not good. Yeah, and this is 1981. If you've looked back at all the other golf games, think of Atari Golf. Here, I'll put another coin in and push start. Think of the golf game for the Intellivision and all the the ones we played on the home consoles. It's still nothing, nothing like this. Over the tree. Oh, too big of a tree. <laughs> I thought for sure I could make it over that. Let's see if a three wood will do it. Will it go over? <laughs> Didn't really judge the 3D perspective there. The artwork you see behind me is what you would have seen on the Deco cassette system. Oh man, that doesn't work. I, I should have gone to the right. Sliced it a little bit. Too bad. Uh, let's go a little bit now. Let's go back to, can I do one wood? Oh, I can't do one wood. Okay. It's very arcadey, very fun. What's really interesting is the Deco Cassette System was one of the first arcade games that you could just switch one part out, like a cartridge, and have a new game. And it's going to be uh, what we'll see later on uh, SNK's Neo Geo. You have a cartridge you switch out inside the system. And this game really reminds me of like a Neo Geo golf game back in 1981. It, it just plays so easy and well. And it's just so much fun. And there we go. That is the game of tournament pro golf. That is so good. In fact, I gave pro golf four and a half stars. I'm going to go full five. This is uh, this is amazing. They, they put in so many mechanics that work. They even got the radar that we saw back with Rally X and Defender. And um, they have the, the, the game plays too well and too easy to be any other sports game or golf game. It, it's, it's excellent. The best of the best golf right there in 1981. And now let's see what our next game is. We're next putting in the palm of our hand, Towering Inferno. So from the best in the arcade, ugh, I don't know what a handheld is going to be like. Let's take a look at the artwork for Towering Inferno. Here's the front of the box in France. Trimblement du Terre, and we have also in Europe the Towering Rescue, or the UK. 
And there's the example of the handheld itself. This is by Gakken. <laughs> Terrible name for a company. This is their LCD card game. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, maybe it has a card you slip in and out to switch out games. No, it's not. It, it just means this game is about the size of a card, like a credit card. That's what they're boasting. We don't have a manual like usual, so let's put in the palm of our hands. Towering Rescue, released at some point in 1981 by Gakken. Let's see what they got, Gakken. Here we go. Now this one looks really nice. See if you have the two buttons on either side. Now this one's even smaller than the other handhelds we've seen. The Game & Watch is slightly larger, like two credit card links. This is smaller than that, and we're going to be playing on the screen. So just bear that in mind. That's why the buttons look a little larger. Probably zoomed in way too much for the for purposes of the channel. But let's check out game A. Let's go. Looks like I am a... Oh, I'm a plane. Okay, so I'm going to go to left and right. I only have two buttons. You hover over the people, and then after you get to the top, you pick them up and then deliver them to the side and save them. I love handhelds. You can put it in the palm of your hand and figure it out in a few seconds. Even easier than arcade games. Now I want to know, what happens if I don't rescue anybody? Because it's doing it pretty simple. Let's just hang it over here and see what happens if you don't. Is there a fire down below? I don't see any, any animation for it. Oh, they just fall off. Oh, it breaks the building apart. The yeah, part of the building is the LCD. I gotcha. All right, let's check out game B. Let's push that one and see how game B fares if it's any more difficult. Usually it's the just harder, faster version of it. At least that's what it's like on the Nintendo Game & Watch. It really shows you the influence of Nintendo in the handheld world. Every other handheld that's trying to do something that Nintendo Game & Watch does looks and acts the exact same way. It has game A, has game B, it has the time. It's it's total ripoff of what Nintendo started. That Nintendo's up to something. I think they're going to do good things. I can't tell the difference between game A and game B. It still looks just as easy. Or maybe I'm just a master at towering inferno. <laughs> oh, wait, what happened? Did I smash? <laughs> I looked away at the chat and now I'm smashed into the side. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go to game B again. Oh, I see. If you go too far to the left or right, then it smashes. So if, can I do <laughs> it? does. And then that, that's it. It, it kind of bricks the game. There's no way to get out once you smash into the left or right. So you have to, okay, so you have to be careful. You don't go too far to the left or too far to the right. There's a quick tip for you for all those towering Inferno fans. All right, for all the handhelds we've played up to this point, it's it's all right. Uh, picking something up, going into the other side, we've seen it before. It's uh, it's around average still. So three stars for Towering Inferno. Not doing anything good, not doing anything bad. And with that, we went from arcade to handheld. Let's see where we're going now. We're going back to the arcades, and this is Treasure Island. Another one by Data East. Let's take a look at the artwork for Treasure Island. Yes, so this is another Deco cassette system. Got to remember that when we load it up and make sure we can fast forward it. Treasure Island, new, exciting, different. Explorer uses his skill to climb the peak of a sinking island containing a myriad of trails and tunnels. He must quickly choose his way, collecting treasures while dodging monsters, eggs rolling down the mountainside. He can also break the eggs by throwing rocks before they hatch. Deadly man-eating monsters. It's uh, one or two players, I believe, alternating, so not simultaneous play. There's the example of the circuit board. Where is the deco cassette system? I don't see it here. Maybe this is the standalone one. Yeah, there's the control panel for the uh, the deco. The Data East. This is the four-way joystick with one button for firing for Treasure Island and an example of the screenshot. Different versions. We have this different sets of the deco cassette system and the standalone. We're going to go the deco cassette way. Here we go. At some point in 1981, we got Treasure Island for from Data East. I thought it was going to be pirate themed, but I guess not. I will hear the artwork shows us like we're, you know, I'll switch it out for you. It looks like the artwork's making us on the beach as if we were pirates. Let's go. We don't have all day. 
how did you wait for the system to load? The, what if you're booting up your arcade as an operator? So we're in Japan for the first time you were able to play this. Can you imagine having to wait for the systems to boot up? Because most of the time the boot up sequence for the arcade systems is maybe uh, a minute tops, two minutes tops. But to wait that long, yikes. There we go. Here's the attract mode for Treasure Island. No pirates involved. Looks like we're a cute chibi character as the explorer. If you look in the top left, there's the points for everything and the different enemies coming after us. Nice. Looks like we fight Satan. That's always a good sign. Dragons. And then they do the top score with initials. Very nice. Whoa. Okay, no way. The color palette reminds me of Fantasy we saw in the arcade. All right, this is bizarre. So um, we haven't really talked about the isometric view on the channel because we haven't seen that much. We had a, uh, in television soccer that was in an isometric view. But uh, technically, if you want to get scientific about it, isometric really isn't the correct term. It's For video games, it's usually uh, diametric. And this one is true isometric uh, right here, this viewpoint. But I thought for sure it was Qbert that was first doing an isometric game. But here we are, the year before, Qbert comes out next year, and this game is in an isometric perspective, which I wonder what that's going to be like with the controls, because it's on the Deco cassette board. Blows my mind again. I thought Qbert was the first game to play an isometric way, but nope, it's Treasure Island. Well, unless you want to count, we also had a dart scheme that was in isometric, but it's really not the, the gameplay. It's more of like playing a platformer, but I don't think we're going to jump. Let's see. Putting a coin in and pushing start. Got a nice cute little ditty when you come in. Oh, you have to follow the lines. Weird. Okay, so it's not very easy. <laughs> it's not very smooth controls. Well, I guess most people that don't, don't like isometric games would say that too, right? Nice. Okay, so you can throw the rocks. I found my action button. Yeah, the palettes and the colors are so, way out there. Yeah, but you have to stay on the lines. If you leave the lines, it won't work. What happens if I go in that door over there? No, there's a... <laughs> and a Yeti comes out and kills me. We're already gamed over. So um, it is... It's it's very difficult to explain, but the controls mean you have to stay on the lines, which means if you start to move in one direction on the line and you and you push the wrong way, it's not going to let you go. What? No way. They're going to use the... <laughs> they're using... To put your initials in, you have to use the isometric control scheme. Oh my gosh. No way. Can I do it? C... I don't think... All right. That wasn't as painful as I thought it would be. <laughs> but still, they went full on let's do the isometric view hardcore all right let's put another coin in and give it another shot maybe i'm just being hard on it or because we haven't played a lot of isometric viewed games but it's weird like this is me moving the joystick to the right this is me moving the joystick to the, to the left so it's not true to the left or true to the right it's to the right and up and to the left and up all right let's see if we can get, pick up can i pick up my treasure it's a treasure island how often can I throw those rocks? As much as I want? Good. And the idea is you move to the top without getting drowned in the water below. Oh no, no. <laughs> See right there. I knew I needed to go a certain direction, but because I wasn't right on the line, I couldn't I couldn't go that correctly. So I applaud Data East for changing the viewpoint up and having a vertically it's a vertically scrolling game, automatic scrolling. It's not jumping, it's not technically a platformer, but it is it's a, it is different. Let's go again. I got enough yen, we're gonna use it all here on Treasure Island. Okay, I'm kinda getting used to it, but still, if I, if I think to myself, I wanna go to the right, I have to move the joystick to the right, now I need to go up. Oh, he got me right before. Looks like I got infinite boulders to throw. And the treasures is just extra points, but the main draw is can you continue? Can you continue to move up uh, without stopping? Nope, go down, right. 
I have to tell my brain which way I need to go. Okay, go in that door. Where do I go? Okay, back out here. Now go up. Knock him out. I need to really use those liberally. Just continue to throw them because it doesn't wear out. All right, let's go in this door. <laughs> and it just brings me out the other side. That's not good. Let's go back here. Are we at the top? No! I don't know what happens if we get to the top. Now I really want to see. Can I keep going? Yes, go. Go. To the right. Quick. Wait, what? No, the top door. Oh, I see. You don't go you don't go through the door. You you moved on the line to the the castle at the top. Oh, that is cheap. You got me daddy east this time. I cannot spend the time to put that is <laughs> that takes a little bit even more effort to put in your initials. Okay, let's go again. We got enough coins. Here we go. It is very very bright color scheme. We just saw another game on the the, the deco, the um, uh, uh, professional or, or tournament pro golf. So, I mean, we we know it can do something that is not crazy blinding you with lights. Oh darn! Went a little too high up to the top of the screen. I want to see if I can make it to that castle at the top. There we go. Get out of here. Now you got to move up to move up into the left. Up. To move up into the left. No, go! Oh man, that was close. I can't believe that. Oh man, now you also have to face the right way to throw the boulders. They follow the lines kind of like you do. Oh my gosh. Go! No, go! To the right, go up! Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did it. That was right. On the edge of my seat, I can't believe that it worked. Oh, and you moved to another area, so they just palette swap the, the graphics, it looks like. So it's a totally different Treasure Island. But you do get other levels to see. So it gives you something to work for, but as the first uh, video game that's taking an isometric perspective where you have to move the character that way, this is the very first. And it's, it's actually isometric, it's not di diametric. So I'd say... Treasure Island is doing something new and unique, and kind of like when I play other games that are and on this uh, viewpoint, it takes a while to get used to. So I was starting to get used to it. It, it was more tricky because of the lines uh, to play the game. So I'm going to say it's 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 still a real, an above average game. I'll say three and a half stars for Treasure Island. <laughs> if the bright colors don't uh, appeal to you, but just imagine you're in an arcade with everything. You see the attract mode for all these different games. And in 1981, I mean, we got Frogger, we got Donkey Kong, we got lo lots of really heavy hitters out there. And then this one shows up, it would be it would be okay. It'd be all right. All right, so after the arcade, let's see where we're going now. We're going to the Coco. Let's check out Trek Adventure. Slipped in just in the nick of time. Let's take a look at the artwork we have for Trek Adventure. It's not much. All we have is two different advertising flyers. <laughs> Trek by Bob Rattel. This takes place, place aboard a familiar starship and is a must for Trekkies. Thank, uh, this is right before the licenses for Paramount and Star Trek and the movies and all that stuff started to really uh, 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 hit hard on all the games that are based off Star Trek. Because we've already played lots of clones that aren't licensed at all. And so this is one of those games where we're going to be playing inside the starship and we get to be Captain Kirk and make decisions inside the ship. So here is the ad for Trek Adventure. It takes place in a familiar starship. They're not really hinting completely at it. Almost as good as being there. So 15 bucks. This is Aardvark Technical Services. You can see and, buy the and the manual we have is just some notes that I got from L. Curtis B. Thanks so much, L. Curtis B. Here we go. At some point in 1981, we got Trek Adventure by Bob Rattel. Let's see how to load this sucker. All right, run it. So Trek Adventure, every time we see the word adventure at the end of a game, it means it's a text adventure in 1981. So this is a Star Trek text adventure. You're on. <laughs> Did they pause because we're Captain Kirk? You're on. You are on the wreck bridge of the Starship Enterprise. You can see main view screen. Your first panel, Spock's position, turbo lift, obvious exits are... It doesn't tell us, so we have no obvious exits. Okay, look at that panel there. 
What is the panel see? Message tape. The main view screen, you heard a panel. So just like before, let's play the tape. Which 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 text adventure game did this first? We saw this, I think, in 79, where they had a tape recorder and we played the tape. And that's how they started the, the game off. Ship severely damaged by freak ion storm. Engines damaged, transporter out, abandoning ship in shuttlecraft. Okay, yeah, uh, we're going to be on the ship, so I don't know if there's any dancing green women around, but uh, if they have all the people from Star uh, from Star Trek here, this is awesome for a Trekkie fan. I am a Trekkie fan, so pl playing the game where it's a text adventure game, like you're playing as Kirk on the ship, is, is awesome. All right, so it looks like we need to get to work, so let's go to the turbo lift. Go turbo lift. You are... <laughs> Every time the double dashes, I think of reading it like... William Shatner, you are in the turbo lift. You can see nothing. Obvious exits are out, up, and down. All right, so let's go down. Go down the turbo lift. Obvious exits are... So go out. We are out of the turbo... Oh, if you can spell it right. Go out of the turbo lift. <laughs> Does not compute. That's awesome. Very quaint. <laughs> oh, he really was? That's so funny. You are in a corridor. You can see closed door. So we're out of the turbo lift. And like usual, I'm looking at a walkthrough so I know exactly what to do. Let's go north to roam the corridors. You are in a corridor. You can see nothing. And then go west. This is awesome. Being able to map out inside of the Starship Enterprise. Now, it's all non-canon. It's it's something that's not licensed at all. So it's just someone that watched the show was a big fan and made their own map for everything. You are in a corridor. You can see nothing. From here, uh, go south and west to reach the gym. All right. Wait, do we already do that? No. Go out north. Wait, uh, go south. Oh, my gosh. See, it's already a maze in the Enterprise. And then go west. You are in a gym. You can see gym equipment. Lockers, closed door, viewport. Ventilator, computer terminal. And now we open lockers. Wait, did the lockers open? They did open, and then we have to look inside, of course. You can see uniform, shoes, gym equipment, open locker, closed door, viewport, ventilator, computer terminal. So we have uniforms. Let's look at the uniforms. Look, uniforms. You can see uniform shoes, pockets, gym equipment. Yeah, we can. We know about those. Look, pockets. So looking at the uniform makes the pocket appear, and then that henceforth, that's the puzzle, and, and so forth and so forth. And in the pockets, we have the ID badge and pencil. Got it. And so now what we do is take that badge. Got the badge. Does I work for inventory? No. What about I and V? There we go. I and V is inventory. Nice. And then after we take the badge, what about the pencil? Take pencil. Yes, I want that pencil. And now we go east. Leave the gym. We are in a corridor. You can see a closed door. Now, this is another game that you'd have to have a map out for it because I'm, I'm following the walkthrough for this, but uh, in 1981, uh, apologies if I'm not giving you the authentic 1981 experience. I've done that with lots of adventure games, which is a lot of mystery and you don't know what to type in and you usually have people over your shoulders telling you what to say. Thank you, chat. And now that we know everything and know where to go, it still blows my mind. You have to write all this down on the map to know exactly where you're, where you're going. That's what you did. So we took the badge, we go east. Oh, I already lost my sense of... Yeah, so we went east, now go north. Go back to where we were. Now go east. Is everyone following this? We're back in the corridor. Go north. And now we're in security. Nice. Now because it's made for Star Trek fans, this is so fun being able to walk around in the Enterprise. One of the few games where I'm trying to think of, we played the strategy game, Star Trek, where you're able to control different systems, but it's more of a higher level. You know, uh, long range sensors, short range sensors, and so forth. But being inside, this is the very first time we've seen uh, this kind of game uh, do that with Star Trek. All right, so let's have in the 
armory. Open armory. Authorized personnel only. Present ID. Well, we got our badge. <laughs> How do we... I guess we just type it back, right? Present ID. I guess that worked. It doesn't tell us if it did or not. And I didn't get any uh, William Shatner talking. So now we go from there. Now we look. Armory. What's in that armory now that we got it open? We got... ID badge, detention cells. <laughs> yeah, the, the logic of text adventure games doesn't make sense. If we are Captain Kirk, why do we need to go get the badge to... I, I guess maybe if, maybe we're naked for some reason. And we had to go get our badge from our clothes back in the lockers. That, that would make more sense. But you, you have to think of the mind of a text adventure game uh, writer. Uh, because all this stuff is, is only in their head. And then you have to understand what the computer wants you to say. It's all over the place. All right, so armory, look, armory. Where's the weapons? It doesn't say take phaser. Can't do it. Open armory. Oh, if I can spell open armory. There, look, armory. Yeah, take that phaser. Got it. Got the phaser. And take badge. Nice. What else is here? What's a click at? Take click at. Inventory. We have a click at. I don't know what it is. Look. Can I look click at? Click at. Nah, you can't tell what the click at is. Maybe examine? Click at. <laughs> what does not compute? It's like Spock's right behind us while we play the game. Captain, it does not compute. Spock, tell us what a click at is. Please, I want to know. We all want to know. So if that's not the click at, then next thing would be, let's just move on by going south. Let's get out of here and go west. Still in a corridor. Got to map this whole thing out. <laughs> yeah, better have something. We need to fire something with our phaser. Can I shoot right now? Shoot phaser. No effect. Set phasers to kill. All right, so we went... What was that? West. And then from west, go west again. And then go west again. You're in... You are in a cabin. You can see Sorry and Brandy. Get Brandy. Nice. And get Pillow. And get Mirror. Can we get the mirror? Can't do it. Must be on the wall. Too bad. All right. So you can do without the Brandy and the mirror is confusing, it says in my walkthrough, but I, I'm not sure about that. I would want to do that. Oh, thanks for looking that up. It's a Klingon. Well, I should have known it was something Klingon, but yes, Klingon blade. That means can we use that? I want to go slice uh, something up with like, just just shoot and kill something, right? Oh man, oh man, that is so much fun. All right, so for the text adventure games we had for the time, it is still using two word text parser. It is not doing anything uh, technically more impressive than others. It's more of the theme that drives it. So if you're a Trekkie fan, it's kind of like if you played a game that's based on one series uh, from like if Jaws, the game where you get to experience Jaws from a text adventure viewpoint and you were a big fan of it, it'd be really, really fun. So I'm gonna say for all the games we played up to this point, for me, I'm going to say three and a half stars. I want to keep going and play some more and check out the Enterprise, even though it's not the legit Enterprise. It's part of the Enterprise of some that's in someone's head if they were a big Trekkie fan. That's pretty fun. I love it. All right, so let's move on and check out our next game. Our next game is Tunnel Hunt. We're going to the arcades. This one, I got to preface everybody before we start. Uh, I'll, I'll go in the artwork. So let's take a look at the advertising flyer for Tunnel Hunt. Tunnel Hunt is one of the first games that might give you motion sickness. So if anyone's watching and you're a little sensitive to that, this is one of the first games we've ever played that's going to do that. Behold, Century brings you the depths of space. 
This one has an exorbitant history. It went from back and forth in different places. As far as pinning down when the exact release date was, I'm sure I'm going to get five or six different groups of people that are going to say something different when this came out. But we're going to say at some point in 1981 was when Tunnel Hunt finally came out. You play most video games with Tunnel Hunt. You, be <laughs> you become a part of it. Are you ready to discover a completely new video experience? You can see what the arcade cabinet looks like. It is wrapping around you a little more than usual. So it kind of encases you in. So already it's an experience I cannot give you exactly like you would be in, in the arcades. This is also really rare. If you can find one of these and play it, do it. I have not seen one of these to play myself. So we challenge you to find a game that offers you the speed and excitement of Tunnel Hunt. This is Centuri like firing on all cylinders, doing everything they can. There's the example of the arcade cabinet, but you can't make out most of it because it's using blinders, like if you're taking a test at school on the sides, to wrap you in. Take a look at the controls. It is a full-on joystick, a giant one, and you have a shield button and a start button. And that's what you have there. It's also known as tube chase, if Tunnel Hunt doesn't uh, sound familiar to you. And we do have the manual for Tunnel Hunt, the service manual by Centuri. Does it tell us about Tunnel Hunt? Let's see, user information, notes, front view, gameplay. All right, it does have something possibly about what the game is? There we go, that's a great example of the arcade cabinet. One of the very few we've seen that extends this far out, which is another reason it's kind of hard to come by. We already have operators wanting easy games that they can put in without having to spend any more money. So this mode's entered with the flashing start buttons pushed. The start LED will stay on and all sounds will be activated. You'll be placed out of space and the tunnel will appear in front of you. The speed will be minimum. Ships will appear from either down the tunnel or fly overhead and past you. A white cursor will appear in the center of the screen and use this joystick that's in the center to move around and then you hit your fire button to blow them up. It has different difficulty levels that you'll go through. If a ship is hit, it explodes into pieces and a sound will start. So does it explain... Oh, okay, so it has uh, explains about the laser fire. Each shot heats up the laser, not, allow, uh, not shooting allows it to cool, but at a slower rate. Temperature of the laser is seen on the laser temp displayed near the bottom of the screen. A moving bar shows the temp at any time. Laser gets hotter and hotter. Oh, it's like Threshold. <laughs> and it wasn't the first. We played other games that had that uh, kind of mechanic. And then we have the shields to block us from enemy shots that come at us. And hole temperature. So this game is attempting to do an experience in the arcade, not just playing an arcade game. It is a different kind of video game because you are uh, holding a joystick that's different than anyone you would have ever experienced. And man, oh man, it's trying to give you a really good 3D feel without using vector graphics, which is kind of interesting. All right, so we have two versions. Uh, one was a tube shooter and the other one by Centauri. Here we go. We're going to the arcade to play Tunnel Hunt, released at some point in 1981. Here we go. Let's put a coin in and check out Tunnel Hunt. Now the joystick is, oh, see, that's so bizarre. <laughs> and the flashing is real too. You gotta get in this um, uh, mesmerized mode as you fly around because the cursor isn't moving freely, it's static. It's the background that moves. So I'm not, I'm, I'm moving the joystick and I'm obviously shooting TIE Fighters. Or TIE Bombers. Go, oh, I need to figure out my shield button. Oh my gosh. So if you look down at the bottom, it's giving the laser temperature, shield power, there's my shield. Okay, got my shield up if I need it. Someone comes at me again, I'll use that, but whoa, it's already making me feel a little uh, woozy. And imagine this when it's encased around you in the arcades. I wonder who else uh, got, got a little dizzy playing the game. All right, go shields up, looking good. Whoa, yeah, and it moves so fast. Wow, yeah. It, it is definitely an experience, something we haven't seen on the channel before. We've had games that attempt this, a first-person view, kind of a rail shooter game, but not to this level of 3D. It, it almost reminds me of rudimentary uh, uh, VR at the time. Wow. Enter your score. Can we get... <laughs> I won't spend the time to try to get my name in. Just call me KZZ. There we go, Tunnel Hunt.
That is awesome. Now, if you did get dizzy, you obviously wouldn't like the game. Uh, it, as difficult it was for this to get out in the arcades, I'm going to rate it a little higher because it's, uh, it is an experience and it did take a long time for Centuri with different iterations and variations to finally come out in the open. I'm going to go for four stars for Tunnel Hunt because we've never experienced anything like this. It's almost like putting on a, a, a virtual reality helmet in 1981 and getting uh, disoriented. Very first time you could ever experience that. All right, so that is where we put our video game playing on pause. We almost just merely, barely made it through the tease of the game, but uh, we are going to continue playing every video game in 1981 in alphabetical order till we reach the end. And then we have some even more stragglers of people that mentioned we haven't played yet, and we will check those out. So that's it for today, and like I always say, slice them up and kill them with a Klingat. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if you miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.